Hello, boxing fans. Welcome to another episode of World Championship Boxing. Today, we're going to talk about the greatest performances of Iron Boy Ivan Calderon. And I'm joined once again by Juan Silva. How you doing, man? Hey, good afternoon, Logan. Good afternoon, fight fans. As after a very long, we're talking November, December, January, four months absent of the greatest performances in boxing history, we return with one of the ten greatest Puerto Rican fighters of all time. He's number six on my list. And one of the three greatest 105-pound fighters of all time, number three on my list, the great, the very great Iron Boy Alvin Calderon, who looked like he watched Pernell Whitaker and just morphed into him throughout his entire career. What an incredible boxer. Yeah, he was just an exciting fighter, man. I mean, not the hardest puncher, but, man, just the movement, never wasted. No Always. wasted movement. He threw punches in bunches. He would be right in front of you, and you hit nothing but air in his prime. He went to the body with ferociousness, and he just outworked you. He outthought you. He made you miss. He was just an incredible fighter, an incredible fighter, and, and, went, and went on Timbit. He beat a very young Miguel Cotto as an amateur back in 1993. <laughs> wow. That tells you something. Yeah. As when they were amateurs in Puerto Rico, and both Ivan Calderon and Miguel Cotto, the two greatest Puerto Rican fighters in the last 20 years, A and B, both represented Puerto Rico in the 2000 Olympics. So neither one of those fighters, my father had the privilege of seeing him fight professionally because my father passed away in 2000. My father would have loved Ivan Calderon as much as he would have loved Miguel Cotto. One thing that I, uh, one of the biggest disappointments in life is he didn't get to see two of his native countrymen fight in their prime. He would have loved, he would have sat there and he'd have, he, he, he would have just been uh, filled with adulation and admiration for these two fighters. Uh, we've already spoke about Miguel Cotto on this program. Ivan Calderon is the 10th Puerto Rican star that we've talked about on this show and long overdue and unfortunately not in the International Boxing Hall of Fame and it's going to what? be tough for him to get in because wow. you have next year next year Floyd Mayweather, Andre Ward, and Vladimir Klitschko, and <clears throat> Vladimir Klitschko are on the ballot for the first time. He's not getting in. Because no, it used to be, Logan, where five modern fighters could get in. They've cut it to three. And so he's not wow. getting in next year. This year, Bernard Hopkins, Juan Manuel Marquez, and Shane Mosley got in. So there was no way he was getting in this year. He won't get in next year. I mean, last year, he won't get in this year. It's going to be a minute before he gets in because well. the, the ballot is filled with a lot of great fighters. But he deservedly belongs in. And um, what a great fighter. And we'll, we'll get into uh, his career in a moment. The only Hall of Fame that counts is the World Championship Boxing Hall of Fame, which is what we if have. You get, if, you, uh, if you get an episode about you, about your greatest performances, then he, right. you are a legit Hall of Famer. <laughs> yeah, that's it. The World Championship Boxing <laughs> Hall of Fame. We should probably just yes. change it to that instead of calling it the uh, greatest performances. Well, hey, it's, it's fine. up to you. You want to do that? You want to change that? Go ahead. I, I agree <laughs> with you a thousand percent. Because, I mean, after a while, like, if we start hitting on more accurate, you know, namings, we'll become the more legitimate body, right? I well, mean, and, and, look, and, and look at the fighters that we've talked about. There's not one stiff among and people have people have tweeted me, people have emailed me. I remember one time my boy Big D was like, "Why don't you do a show?" He he tweeted to us on Twitter years ago. Why don't you do a show on um on, on Tommy Morrison after Tommy Morrison died? And I told Danny, "Nah, he he doesn't fit our criteria. <laughs> he, he wasn't a pimple on any of these guys' asses." And no disrespect to Danny, but that's not the he type of fighter we talk about. Well, yeah. yeah, he had his moment. He beat George Foreman. Wow. He beat a 90-year-old George Foreman. And you know what? <laughs> it's an even bigger accomplishment because the, a year later, Foreman knocked out Michael Moore to win the, the Undisputed Heavyweight Championship of the World. So that is a great accomplishment, but not enough. Not enough 
to warrant a place amongst our greats. No. Yeah. No. An unforgettable knockout against Razor Ruddock. I remember that. That was a great – a matter of fact, if we ever revisit greatest fights of all time, that was a great fight. But it was two <laughs> limited fighters. Two limited right. fighters just beating the shit out of each other. And after he beat Ruddock, he got a, a fight against Lennox Lewis where he landed maybe four punches in six rounds. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, yeah you have to – it's only the best of the best that get talked about on this show. And right now, I'm going to talk – Real, 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 real quickly about Isaac Calderon's early uh, childhood. He he was a uh, at risk youth, uh, constantly being arrested, uh, constantly fighting. Boxing did for him what what did for a lot of inner city kids growing up in Guanabo, Puerto Rico. Could be anywhere, South Bronx, Houston. Saved his life. Boxing saved his life. Became an amateur boxer. High school dropout. But boxing saved his life. It was an amateur standout. As I mentioned earlier, he defeated Miguel Cotto when both were light flyweights in 1993 in Puerto Rico in the amateurs. Was a member of the 2000 Olympic team where he lost in the first round. Turned pro, and this is weird, uh, uh, Logan. He was 26 years old when he turned pro in 2001, which is very old for an very amateur old. standout. Yes. And right away, he you could tell. He was going to be a, a, a great one. Just ran through all his opposition. The three fights we'll be talking about will be from April 30th, 2005, against Noel Tunacao. Uh, December 10th, 2005, against former world champion Daniel Reyes. And April 29th, 2006, against Nicaraguan contender Miguel Tellez. Tellez, Tellez. And the, those are the three fights we'll be talking about. So early in his career, he just and he was just beating everybody. Now, no power, not a power puncher. Hundred five, right. uh, hundred and five pounds minimum weight, which is the lowest weight class in boxing, and allegedly five feet tall, maybe four ten at the at the five feet with with heels, four ten probably more likely. He was short. He's the, the shortest great fighter in the history of boxing. I think they called him five feet just so they didn't want to. Uh, uh, he, I guess he didn't. He didn't want the stigma of being on the five feet, but he's not five feet tall. It's like Allen Iverson, the great uh, uh, guard of the '90s and 2000s, uh, was always listed at six one, where he was more like five ten. I met AI in yeah. real life, and I'm five five, and there's no way in the world he was seven to eight inches taller than me. The, the dude was yeah, a legit five inches taller than me. Uh, Ivan Calderon was not five feet tall, listed as five feet tall, and He's fighting guys, Logan, three, four, five, six, six inches taller than him. And he's oh, yeah. making a miss, going to that body. And that's the, the, his entire early career. He wins his first 15, fight, 15 fights, and then and all of them in Puerto Rico. He goes to the United States for the first time on May 3rd, 2003, and beats Eduardo Marquez to win the WBO minimum weight 105-pound title. And then after five uh, successful defenses, he fights Noel Tunacao April 30th, 2005, in the very first fight we talk about on this show of his greatest performances. And in this fight, right away, you see that Tunacao is outclassed. He dropped Tunacao in the very yeah, first, first round. Time. With a beautiful right jab, left cross combination. So the Kyle got up and he should have just stayed down because he went on to take a hellacious beating for eight rounds. Now, Calderon is no slugger. We mentioned he is a boxer in the mode of a Pernell Sweet P. Whitaker. The styles are eerie. Both men were very short for the division. When Pernell Whitaker was the welterweight champion of the world, he was five foot five and a half. Fighting guys 5'9", 5'10", 5'11", 6 feet, and making a miss and just totally dominating them. This was Ivan Calderon at minimum weight. 4'10", 4'11", maybe, on a good day, and he's making these guys miss, but not running in front of you. Like right. Logan said, no wasted movement. He only moved when he was trying to make you miss. Goes to the body like Whitaker. Combination to the body, one of the greatest 
jabs to the body he's ever seen. One of the greatest right jabs, period, for a soft part in the history of the sport. Landing combinations, making you miss, and one of the great counterpunches of the 21st century. Top five. He's on that Floyd Mayweather, Juan Manuel Marquez, uh, Andre Ward counter uh, counterpunch master level. And yes. in this fight, it was a one-sided beating. I mean, he beat the shit out of Tadakoa. And in the eighth round, while landing one punch after another, the referee finally popped the fight. Yeah, um, man. A master class by the great um, I, Yvonne Calderon. Yeah, it's like he uses his height as an asset. And I think that if there was a stat about who was the most missed fighter, I think he might win. He How probably many... did because Floyd rarely went inside. Floyd stayed outside and counterpunched you to death. And you, and you notice Floyd would shut your offense down where you would throw minimal punches. Well, with Calderon, guys were swinging for the fences and getting their hats yeah. busted and not hitting them. So that's a great point. I think him and Whitaker were probably uh, probably would probably lead the history of boxing as far as making you miss. He seemed to have a sixth sense that he would just duck and he would see it out of the corner and, of his eye or something. Oh, he would. Oh, he would. He would dodge the punch and he would miss. Like it, it was the Reyes fight. The next fight we'll talk about where he slipped. And it looked like Reyes might have hit him. No, Reyes totally missed. It was Calderon slipping when he went to the canvas. It wasn't. Yeah. It was nowhere near legit knockdown. It happened so quickly. You look at the replay. Oh, the guy missed. He barely missed uh, uh, Calderon. Calderon was a match, especially against these taller fighters, Logan, going inside, going to the body, and you're trying to carry him, his body punches, and you're missing because his head movement was ridiculous. If you – if you slowed him down, it would look like the Matrix, right? I mean, great point. because they did. Great point. Yeah, if you if you watched his fights in slow motion. Yeah, it looks like when he, when the Matrix when he's dodging the punch and he's just kind of keeping one inch outside of the punch and it just that's what he was doing. He's keeping his head just like one inch away from the punch and then very, and then come back. Very with- very reminiscent of another great Puerto Rican fighter we talked about on this show. The great Wilfred Benitez, whose nickname was Radar, he had that radar-like instinct of Benitez, where he make you miss. And Benitez, like Calderon, did not do a lot of movement. He stayed in front of him. A lot of times, Benitez would be up against the ropes and make you miss. And Calderon, another great point about Calderon, these three fights we're watching, Logan, I don't think he touched the ropes one time in, in, in 29 rounds. <laughs> Yeah, he never did the rope and dope. The only time he was against the ropes was when he had you up against the ropes. Yeah, he was like a matador in there. He would he would circle around yes, usually to the right. Yes, yes. He was the ultimate matador in the ring. And so he destroys to the cow. Decent fighter, not a great fighter, but not in the class of Ivan Calderon. And then after another successful defense, we go on to the next fight, December 10th, 2005 against a, a fighter by the name of Daniel Reyes, who at this point in time had only one loss in his career, a former world champion, tried to regain the 105-pound title against Ivan Calderon. And um, like I mentioned in the first round, Calderon slipped. It, it was no knockdown, but from the first round, every round was a replica of the previous round. It was just a master class in boxing. And, Logan, I'm going to make you laugh. The tail of the tape has both fighters listed as five feet. No fucking way is no way. Reyes and, and Calderon the same height. Reyes looks a good three inches taller than Calderon. If Reyes is 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 five one, then Calderon is four ten. Because that's what I thought. <laughs> looking at this, it didn't matter. He could not hit Calderon. Calderon landed one combination after another. And as the fight progressed, Logan, like a Pernell Whitaker, like a Floyd Mayweather, Calderon got stronger, threw more punches. And between rounds 8 to 11, was landing one combination after another while Reyes couldn't land. He could not touch Calderon. An unbelievable performance. This is one of the 10 greatest performances in the history of this program. That's how great this performance was. This performance was up there with... With Bernard Hopkins' one-sided beating of Tito Trinidad, Joe Joe Calzaghe's uh, 12-round 
beating of Jeff Lacey, Floyd Mayweather's 10-round destruction of Diego Corrales. It was that iconic, that sensational. He was on another level. I mean, he uh, was yeah, like on Jupiter Hopkins Pavlik. on that type of level where it was a master class, a, just a master class in boxing. He went to the body. He landed combination after combination. That right jab was 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 was, was, was like a snake. That left cross landed whenever he wanted to. Uppercut to the Reyes body. Such a good fighter. Only reason Reyes went twelve rounds was because he's a good fighter. He, he knew how to survive because after the seventh or eighth round, he stopped trying. He was just trying to survive. And Cal the Road knew it, and he was just whipping him to the body, landing combination after the tenth and eleventh round. He just landed at will. And yeah. these are the type of fighters, Logan, that end your career. Reyes was never the same after this fight. After this fight, he would lose seven of his last 14, 15 fights before finally retiring. Whoa. He was never the same after the beating Ivan Calderon uh, administered to him. And this was yeah, it's not- a sensational. And um, whoever, three judges, one judge gave Reyes a round. Where the fuck did he find that round? It's not just that he beats you in a way that's humiliating as well. You notice oh, that? In, like, these it's three like... fights, in these three fights, he won every round. In these three fights that we're talking about, he won every round. Reminiscent of how Floyd Mayweather and Pernell Whitaker in their primes used to blank you. If you won a round, it was a victory. Yeah. He won you every make... round in these three fights. Yeah, he makes he makes their other fighter look like an amateur, even though they're very good yes. fighters. So that's the trick, man. It's hard to do that. It, are we talking about here skill or reflexes? And I guess we find out later in his career. Uh, it reflexes. Yeah. Reflexes. Okay. Definitely reflexes. Uh, Calderon, uh, the same thing that happened to Pernell Whitaker, Muhammad Ali, Roy Jones Jr., guys that were uh, uh, Sugar Ray Leonard, guys whose speed was – Uber Machine. level was on where once they lost a step, yeah. Once they lost a step, they weren't the same fighter. Or Ali was able to survive because of his heart and his jet ja- and, and his jaw. But these other guys, whatever the same, once they lost a step, that's what would happen to Calderon. And I'll get I'll get into more of that after I talk about the third and final performance. And uh, we go to April twenty ninth, two thousand six. In his hometown of Guanabo, Puerto Rico, and what I love about these these these, these, these fights in Puerto Rico, where Ivan Calderon fights, is all the great Puerto Rican athletes go to see him fight. You will see throughout these three fights, Juan Gonzalez, one of the greatest Puerto, baseball Puerto Ricans of all time, uh, a guy that's been in the news the last two weeks and was fired as manager the other day, Carlos Beltran of the New York Mets. And oh, you see Felix Trinidad. These guys, they, they, they're great Puerto Rican athletes. This is one of their peers, and they go out to support him. They go out to see his fights because they know they're going to see a master at his trade. Now, Miguel Chelyes had no business in the ring with uh, Isaac Calderon. No. If they would have fought 500 times, he would have been beaten 500 times. This was another master class in boxing, counter-punching, going to the body, defense. He sliced them up. He was bloodied, battered. They finally stopped the fight in the ninth round. Every round was a duplicate of the round before. Just Calderon, combination after combination, making him miss. Tellez was dizzy when this fight ended. <laughs> yeah, he was running circles around him. It seemed like it just it was like being in there with the Tasmanian devil and just like boom, 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 just getting hit. <laughs> and I didn't see him and really land a good shot at all. No, no, he did not land one telly shot at all. So after he destroys the, the referee stops the fight in the ninth round, the, the doctor actually stops the fight because he's bleeding from both eyes and the doctor said, that's enough. He would defend his minimum weight title three more times. He, def- he successfully defended the total 11 times, holding it for four years, and ending what I believe, in my opinion, is at that point in time, 
the second greatest 105-pound fighter of all time. Now he's been surpassed. He's the third greatest 105-pound middleweight fighter of all time. And the only two above him are historic fighters. Ricardo Fidito Lopez, number one. We talked about him already. And a guy we'll talk about in the future, probably in March after he fights his next fight, the legendary Roman Chocolatito Gonzalez are the only two fighters in the history of the 105-pound division that are, in my opinion, better than Ivan Calderoni. You don't get any better than that. We're talking about three of the greatest Latin fighters of all time in Finito, Chocolatito, and the Iron Boy. So how would Chocolatito have dealt with a prime um, Iron Boy? I don't understand that. I see Chocolatito winning a close decision because Chocolatito has that great jab. He keeps coming. He's got Chocolatito in his prime, as we'll see in his greatest performances, had great head movement through punches and bunches. But it would not be an easy fight for Chocolatito because he would get hit. But Chocolatito would not get hurt. You got to hurt Chocolatito like Sir Rongasai did. That would happen 10 pounds heavier. I don't see this is the one time where the height and lack of punching power would be a disadvantage for Ivan Calderon, and he gets knocked out by Felito Lopez. There's no way in the world he beats a five foot five guy with a jab and power with both hands like machete. He's not beating a Felito Lopez, and neither is Chocolatito, in my opinion. Chocolatito would have a better shot against Felito than um, Iron Boy, but in the grand scheme of things, and of these three, Felito is my third favorite of these three. I love Iron Boy and Chocolatito more, but I'm going to be honest with you, uh, Finito would beat both fighters, but it would not be easy. It would not be easy. Okay, so these are the three greatest performances, but are these are these his three greatest opponents? No. Uh, the reason I, want, I picked these three is because he only had six knockouts in his career, and these were the only two that were on YouTube for you to watch. I've got mo- the majority of his career. And these were the best guys he, he stopped. But, I mean, he beat a lot of very good fighters. Roberto Leva was a very good fighter. He dominated him twice. Daniel Reyes, we talked about, that was a great win. He would beat Hugo Casares twice. And those were uh, – Hugo Casares was, 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 was a tough motherfucker, very good fighter. Uh, he beat Rodel Mayo, who was a very good fighter. And uh, all these fights – happened after this fight. He would move up to the 108-pound light flyweight division and win the title. But you saw slippage. In his fights against Hugo Cazares, he barely beat Cazares both times. Barely, because he had lost a step. It was his superior defensive skill and skill set that beat Cazares, but he barely beat him. Finally, he would lose his ring world light flyweight title to a very tough and strong Mexican by the name of Giovanni Segura, which was the 2010 fight of the year, ring fight of the year. And the fight was in Guanabo, Puerto Rico, and it was a great fight. But Segura was a tremendous boxer puncher with a great chin who kept coming, kept coming. I mean, Calderon did his best. Early on, he was winning because he was outlanding Segura, but it was like throwing BBs against a guy with a machine gun. <laughs> You're not going to avoid that machine gun too much longer. Finally, in the eighth round, he took a, a hellacious beating before getting knocked out. And that basically was the end of his career. They fought in a rematch six months later, eight months later, and Segura knocked him out in the third round. It was a brutal, be- it was a brutal knockout. And right then and there, he should have retired. He fought two more times before finally getting knocked out by a fringe contender named Moises Fuentes, his final fight at the age of 37, October 6, 2012. The reason he lost okay. these fights, Logan, when he lost to Segura, he was 35 years old. 35-year-old, 108-pound fighter who relied on his speed is not the same fighter. Right. Yeah, it's, uh, it's not going to happen. No, once you lose your step, that guy lost his step while he had a decent chin. He, he he doesn't have great power. And against a firefighter like 
Segura, he had no chance. So you think that this guy is the third best because you put Chocolatito above him. But recently, yeah, Chocolatito put, I, is, has been shown to Ch- split himself, right? Yeah, but Chocolatito at 105, Chocolatito was unbeatable. Chocolatito's not 115. I'm talking about just at 105 pounds. At 105 pounds, Chocolatito, Finito, and Calderon were unbeatable. Those were the three best at that division. Lopez never lost. He had one controversial draw in his career, but never lost. While Chocolatito and Calderon showed signs, signs of slippage when they moved up. Not at 105. So, 105, three, these, these three guys lost. are unbeatable. And as far All as right. Puerto Rican fighters go, you, make, you can make an argument he's the greatest pure boxer in the history of Puerto Rico. A long-time listener, Rafael Toro, shout out to him, believes he's the best pure Puerto Rican boxer of all time, and he's got a great argument. The only person that I would say is possibly better than Calderon as far as being a pure boxer was the legendary Wilfred Benitez. That's it. Hector Camacho ran too much, ran too fucking much, right, to be a better pure boxer than Ivan Calderon. Uh, when we go to the greatest Puerto Rican fighters of all time, you know the top of the list is Wilfredo Gomez, Felix Trinidad, Miguel Cotto. They're your top three. However you want to put them in what order, I'm not going to argue. Those are your three greatest Puerto Rican fighters of all time, followed by Carlos Ortiz at four, Wilfred Benitez at five, and then I would put Ivan Calderon at six. His, who's the most famous, uh, Cotto? Trinidad, baby. It's, it's between Tr- – I would say Trinidad was more famous than Cotto. Trinidad was a household name. Yeah. Hector Camacho is the most infamous, but Trinidad is the most famous. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. We can wrap it up unless you want to say anything more about Yvonne. Oh, real quickly. After he retired, Yvonne has had a great – post-fight career. He owns several businesses in real estate throughout Puerto Rico. He's independently wealthy, and he has been a boxing announcer, and he's a very good boxing announcer in Spanish. And he recently became a boxing trainer. So he has, he's got a lot of irons in the fire, and he at, 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 at the age of 44 years old, he's about to turn 45, He's had a tremendous post-fight career set for life. His children are set for life. Congratulations. One of the few post-fight stories on this program that ended positively. He's had a tremendous post-fight career. Well, mainly because of his style. His elusive style preserved his senses. His he didn't get great. punched. His... It, yeah, yeah. So yeah. He's not a CTE sufferer. No. I mean, he got hit. You're, you say he got some beatings in the in the later part of his career, yeah, but he, that was... he lost three of his last four fights by knockout. But he was smart. He got the fuck out. He he right. knew he couldn't fight anymore, and he had money. The hunger was gone. The skill is gone. He said, "Man, fuck this. Let me go make my money." Yeah. I just want to uh, bring up uh, to rest in peace Zorg, who yes, was a ahead. former host on the show. Uh, before when Silva and I started doing it, uh, I was doing it with Zorg, and you can hear on the archives some of our shows. But uh, he's he suddenly passed away at the age of 61, uh, just sitting on his couch. Uh, apparently, he went peacefully, but rest in peace, my brother. Right, the, and, the man uh, was a wealth of box. The man was a wealth of boxing knowledge. I had a privilege of doing two shows with with, with him and you. And uh, the man off the top of his head, like myself, he didn't have to be in front of no computer, nothing. He could recite things. And I remember at one point we were doing simultaneous shows. You were doing the, the boxing uh, recaps with him, and I was doing the greatest fight series with you. And you right. would ask him about the fights that we talked about it right off the top. Oh, yeah, I remember that fight. Oh my God, that was a yeah, Matthew Samba. And I, and I was like, yeah, this guy, this guy's great. Love Zorg, love Zorg. One of the most knowledgeable boxing fans I've ever heard and ever had the pleasure of talking to. Yeah, and he was a great guy, funny guy, and um, you know we're gonna miss him. And I, you know, it was so sudden to hear. You know, I, I had just talked to him the week before, and then suddenly I heard on saw on Facebook that he's passed away. Great. So. Rest in peace, and, uh, you know, you'll live on in all the archives here. So, one Silva, man, um, I 
I, um, I appreciate this. Uh, this is the first show of our 2020 season. So why don't you give out your Twitter and uh, stuff like that? You can reach me. At you First, my email, Robert Silva, R-O-B-E-R-T-S-I-L-V-A, 57 at hotmail.com. And then my Twitter handle is Robert Silva, S-I-L-V-A, 5768 on Twitter. Great. So, yeah, so refer your questions there. And usually when he gets tweeted a question, he'll bring it up on the show. So that's the best way to get your views on the show. If you have some some opinion you want to give about some of the reviews that we've given here, please tell us and we'll, we'll and, air and, it on the show. And, and, and I love our listeners because none of them get at me with bullshit. The, 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 the Post 87ers, the Post 87ers <laughs> that listen to the show value my opinion. Love our show, and, I mean, they'll DM me and they'll tweet me, oh, what do you think about this guy? What do you think about that guy? If they don't come out and say, oh, Triple G would have knocked out Marvin Hagler. I'm glad that you young fellas that listen, you young fellas that listen to the show are knowledgeable in itself to, not to come at me with bullshit like that. So I appreciate that. <laughs> it was yesterday. Uh, I was tweeting back and forth with the legendary – writer and editor of Ring Magazine, Doug Fisher, Dougie Fisher. I told Doug, in my opinion, Floyd Mayweather was the greatest junior lightweight of all time. Doug came back and said, well, you know, you got Aguayo, you got Julio Cesar Chavez, and I went back and said, oh, yeah, those guys are in my top five. Then some idiot out of nowhere goes, well, why didn't, why didn't Floyd fight Pacquiao at junior lightweight? When Floyd Mayweather moved up to lightweight in 2002, from 130 to 135, Manny Pacquiao was a super bantamweight. I just uh, wanted well, to address that. I, I, and that was my retort on, on Twitter. I said, uh, how could a super bantamweight fight a guy that's moving up to lightweight? Explain that to me. <laughs> and, then, and, and then Dougie, like, like the gentleman he is, got in between us and said, well, uh, to be honest with you, Manny was 122 at the time. You're right, Robert. Floyd went up to 135, and Manny was 122. He was struggling to make 122. Uh, he could have fought a junior lightweight if he wanted to, but that fight wasn't going to happen. Manny just came into the country, and Floyd moved up to lightweight. So before you make an asinine comment, do your research first. Yeah, I know, because that shit will burn you, man. <laughs> but uh, it's still... Even if you, even if you uh, answer, ask a stupid question, we'll bring it up, because you know, people come into boxing with all kinds of different levels of knowledge. So let's just, uh, but don't be hey, let me, let me tell you something. Don't be an asshole. I got a couple of guys. I'm going to shout them out right now. My man, Chris of Gale and Bilal Garcia. They haven't been following boxing for a while. They DM me all the time. They ask me questions. They ask me all types of questions. I ask them all the time. These guys are sponges. They want to know everything about boxing as possible. So guys like that, I love their questions. Don't come at me with the bullshit that homeboy asked yesterday, though. That's that's stupid. I don't want to hear that. I'm not even going to acknowledge that. Probably a guy who hates Floyd and believes that Floyd was was, was ducking Pacquiao you back then, even though Floyd probably didn't even heard of Pacquiao at the moment. <laughs> yeah, like, you're, you're talking in class and you haven't done the reading. This yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. So anyway, with that being said, I appreciate the listeners. Shoot out the questions. You got my email. You got my Twitter handle. I haven't decided who we'll talk about next week, but it'll be another great great fighter who is either in the Hall of Fame or is on the precipice of being in the Hall of Fame, but will be in our Hall of Fame. Well, tell about who's going to be on our – what's going to be the next fight recap show that we do? February, right? Fury Wilder, February 22nd, will definitely be a fight recap show. But there's some interesting fights coming up. We might okay. do one before then, but that's definitely – one that we'll be doing, Wild versus Fury. It'll probably be a, 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 just a one fight, uh, one, one, one fight recap show because the undercard is horrendous. Man, mm. it doesn't need it. Um, yeah. But yeah. All right, man. So we'll be looking into that, and uh, you'll you'll get on Twitter, check out yeah. what our next greatest performances will be. One Silver, man. Thanks again, man. Have a great uh, Sunday. Enjoy the rest of the week, and I'll talk to you next Sunday. Talk to you then, buddy. Peace. Peace.